Today, we're going to be exploring a system that's very nostalgic for me. We'll be having a look at the Power Mac G4 and finding out if it's worth getting hold of one of these to run classic Mac apps and games. We'll be checking out its history and the roots of the modern Mac operating system. And what can you use it for in 2020? Is it still a viable machine for any modern tasks? Today's video is sponsored by our good friends at Fast Hosts. Now, they've actually let me write a question for their techie test. And if you're based in the UK and you know the answer, you could win the trip of a lifetime. A chance for you and a friend to win two tickets to the legendary South by Southwest, where they combine the best live music and the best technology from all around the world, including flights and accommodation. Now, the techie test question is, this console was initially produced by Panasonic in 1993 and was actually named Time Magazine's Product of the Year. Which console was it? Have a think about it, I'll explain more and tell you how you can win later in this video. So let's rewind 20 years. Going back to my college and then university days, and yes, it's really been that long. Back then, I would actually spend a lot of my time using Macs. Not only using creative software like Photoshop, making things in Macromedia Flash, and using Quark Express for DTP as part of my course, but also at college, we had a multimedia room that was filled with about 30 network Macs, consisting of mainly iMac G3s, Power Mac G3s, and then G4s. And I would often use them after hours or on weekends, as the computer lab was open until midnight almost every night. And usually, I would have the room to myself, often having all 30 machines, downloading music on Napster, or getting a few friends in to play some multiplayer games. Before then, I didn't really have a lot of experience with Macs. My auntie and uncle used to run a print shop in Shrewsbury here in the UK back in the late 80s, and I do vividly remember messing around with the Macs at their shop as a little kid. And I remember it being the first time I ever got to use a computer mouse, and also drawing pictures in Mac Paint and then printing them out. The Macs we had at college mostly ran Mac OS 9, and I did quickly become really fond of these machines. The Power Mac G4 was launched in August 1999 by, of course, Steve Jobs. It was the successor to the blue and white Power Mac G3, and it retained a similar case design, but I think it looked a lot more professional with its more muted graphite color scheme. The system was based around the PowerPC G4 CPU, as Apple named it, or the PowerPC 7400 family, as Motorola and Freescale more sensibly named it. Now, my model is a 400 megahertz gigabit ethernet sawtooth model with AGP graphics. Released in July of 2000, this machine actually used a new motherboard design, supporting features like bootable USB, two separate USB controllers, and a faster RAM bus than the previous model. The earlier Power Mac G4 have a motherboard that's nicknamed Yikes, and they were actually based on the earlier Power Mac G3 board design, but had a lot of bottlenecks in place. Now, this video is not going to be a retrospective of all the various models or their history. Instead, we're going to take a look at my machine and some of the things I like to do with it. And yes, we are in the flowery wallpaper room again now, where last time I did a video in here, I think the majority of the comments on the video were talking about this wallpaper. Just so you know, it's only one wall in my kitchen. My entire house isn't decorated like this, although it probably would be if my wife got her own way. Anyway, back to the machine. Now, I've got a complete system here with the Apple USB keyboard, the Pro Optical Mouse, and an LCD display that was actually made a bit earlier in 1998 for the Power Mac G3, but it actually works fine with anything with a VGA connector. Now, I probably will pick up one of the later Apple Studio displays that had the G4 styling at some point, but this will do for now. And these Power Macs are actually quite affordable at the moment. You can pick these up from anything from free on places like Gumtree and Freecycle to around 20 to 100 pounds on eBay, depending on condition and what it comes with. They did release a faster 500 megahertz model that was actually a bit of a struggle for Apple. It was supposed to ship in October of 1999, but due to yield issues with the CPUs, they couldn't reliably run this fast. So Apple actually reduced the clock speed of each system in the range by 50 megahertz, but they didn't reduce the price. <laughs> Good old Apple. The issues were sorted out a few months later, and the first 500 megahertz models began shipping in February of 2000. 
Now, my particular model was on the lower end of the price scale, retailing at $1,599 at launch. And I do actually really like the design of the Power Mac G4. At the time, Apple were going for this translucent pinstripe look, and you've got these carry handles on the top that make it really easy to transport the Power Mac G4 around. There's a big Apple logo on the side of the case, and in the center of the front as well. Underneath that, we've got an optical five-speed DVD ROM drive with a physical eject button, a spare bay underneath that you could actually have an optional zip drive fitted here from Apple. An internal speaker is underneath. The quality is pretty terrible, as you'd expect from a built-in speaker, but it's kind of handy that it's there. And the glowing power button is below that. Now, I do miss this. I really love this design. And I also like the way that it would snore when the machine was in sleep mode. I thought that was really cute. And there is a physical reset button below it. On the back, we've got two Firewire ports, Ethernet, two dual-channel USB 1.1 ports, an audio input and output, both analog, a modem port, as it has an internal 56K modem, and an intake fan for cooling. This system is fitted with an AGP ATI RAID 128 Pro graphics card with 16 megabytes of SD RAM. And as you can see here, we've got a standard VGA connector and Apple's ADC Apple Display Connector that was a proprietary Apple standard that didn't hang around for too long. And one of the coolest things about these old Power Macs is how easy Apple made it to access the internals and upgrade your machine. And yeah, this is the same Apple that we're talking about who make it nigh on impossible to do that today. And you don't need a screwdriver, no tools, nothing like that. All you got to do is pull the little latch on the side and then the machine opens up. And in here, we can see the G4 processor covered with this nice chunky heatsink. I've only got 512 megabytes in this system, which is what it originally shipped with, but you can actually expand it to a maximum of two gigabytes. Although if you run OS 9, it will only see 1.5 gigs of it. We've got a few hard drive bays at the back. Mine is a bit of a kludge at the moment as I've not got a long enough IDE cable. So what I've got here is two drives, one of them carefully insulated and delicately stacked on top of the other one. We've got the power supply here and some cooling as well. And it is a really nice tidy design and I love how accessible everything is in this machine. The Apple USB keyboard is quite an interesting design as well. It's also got that pinstripe translucent look like the Mac. We've got some black keys that are also a little bit see-through. Two USB ports on the side that are useful for plugging in the mouse. It's got a very short cable. And something that later Apple keyboards lack, a power button. You could actually power off and power on your machine from the keyboard. And this mouse is pretty comfortable for an Apple mouse. I mean, they've never really been famed for making very good mice. But this one, the Pro mouse, has a similar feel and design to their later Mighty Mouse. Now, it does feel a bit like a bar of soap in the hand. It is see-through, and it's an optical mouse as well, with this cool little switch on the bottom that changes the force of the click as to how much pressure you'll actually need to press down on. And you might notice that there is no actual buttons on top of it. Instead, you just press down the whole top section of the mouse, and it clicks. And like I said, I do actually kind of like the look of this. I think it's infinitely better than the mice that we had to use on most of the Macs at college. And that was uh, this thing here, the dreaded hockey puck mouse. Yeah, the less said about this one, the better. So that's a look at the hardware. Next, we're going to get the machine booted up. We're going to play around with some of the old games and software. And we'll take a little trip back in time and check out some of the earliest routes of Mac OS X. And this video is brought to you by Fast Host. Now they offer a wide range of web hosting products and other services to help bring your projects to life. And if you're based in the UK and maybe you're looking to start your own business or you already have, you're gonna need a website to go with it. And regardless of your experience, Fast Host can give you the tools you need to build a strong web presence. With easy registration of a huge choice of domains with powerful management features included, and the ideal way to run WordPress on a fully optimized platform, get instant setup, pre-installed plugins, and auto updates as well. And now, let's give you a chance to win this trip of a lifetime. If you're based in the UK and you and a friend would like to come along to the incredible South by Southwest, including flights and accommodation, you need to answer my techie test question. This console was initially produced by Panasonic in 1993 and was named Time Magazine's Product of the Year. 
Which console was it? So if you think you know, all you've got to do to enter the competition is head to the Fast Host link that you'll find in this video's description. Thanks to Fast Hosts, who are based in the UK with their cutting edge UK data centers based right alongside their offices. And whether you go for a lightweight web hosting package or a fully fledged service, you can talk to their expert support teams 24 7. All right, let's get back to the Pimac G4. Now, I've actually got three operating systems installed on this machine. The one that I usually use is macOS 9.1. But also, as a bit of a curiosity, I've got the first full retail release of OS X as we know it, version 10.0 Cheetah, and the first actual retail release, OS X Server, which is a strange hybrid of macOS and the next step slash open step legacy. Now we'll look at that and talk a bit more about that later on. And I do actually really like the user interface of OS 9, and today it's still got many fans online. And a lot of this software is actually still quite usable today. Now, speaking as someone who's not really much of a fan of paying those monthly subscriptions for software, I could actually get by with using Office for Mac 2001 on this machine. I mean, think about it. How many of the new features in Word or Excel that they've put in there in the last, like, what, 20 years do people actually use? If all you're doing is basic documents and spreadsheets, these still work fine. I've also got Photoshop 7 from 2002 that runs really well on this machine. And while, yeah, I mean, it is nice to have extra grunt of modern CPUs for graphics, but again, for what I use Photoshop for, which is really basic photo editing, doing simple artwork like video thumbnails or podcast covers, this actually does a job just fine. We've got a very outdated version of iTunes on here for our OS 9, which actually predates the iTunes store, so it won't connect to that. But you can play your local files and stream radio services just fine with it. And I'm definitely an Adobe Audition guy for audio editing, but we do have Audacity on here, and it's not all that much different to the modern versions apart from like multi-track support, but you can edit audio on here, it's fine for basic editing. And believe it or not, I've actually been using this um, ancient version of iMovie recently to capture footage of some old 8mm tapes using a Firewire video capture card. And actually, this has worked really good for capturing old standard def video. Now, something that not many Apple fans like to remember, but Internet Explorer was actually the default web browser for the Mac at this stage. Yeah, they were dark days. But as you'd expect for a 20-year-old browser, it doesn't work with a lot today. But there is actually a relatively recent web browser that works with OS 9 called Classilla. Now, I say relatively because the latest version of it is actually from 2016, but it is still by far the most modern and compatible browser for OS 9 today. And of course, there are lots of older Mac games designed for OS 9 that run great on this machine, including actually older 68K software. Now, if you want to check out some really old Mac software, then OS 9 is actually a really good choice for that because not only can you try all the PAL PC stuff, but also most of the 68K programs and games I've tried run fine as well. Sometimes with a bit of tweaking, but I've actually had a really good success rate. So I think OS 9 is lots of fun to use, and it's really the main thing I use this Mac for. But there are some other things that we can explore. Now, if you use Mac OS today, why don't we have a little look back to the roots and see what the current version of OS X looked like right at the start. Now, I'm going to reboot this machine into OS X 10.0 Cheetah. And it was the first one with the big cat names that they used for many years. And this was the first major consumer release of OS X, following on from a public beta. Released in March of 2001, this sold for $129, and initial reaction to OS X was mixed, to say the least. Now, I do vividly remember that we had this installed on one of the Macs in our computer lab, and I did play around with it a little bit, but I found that it really lacked any major software, and I didn't find it all that reliable, so I ended up always using the OS 9 machines instead. And actually, most of the early reviewers agreed with that, but really, you think about it, it was a brand new platform, so that was to be expected. And it did feel like it was still a beta in many ways. And one of the major complaints that people had about the new OS X is how much RAM it needed. It required 128 megabytes of memory and 800 megabytes of hard disk space, which were actually quite demanding for 2001. But it wasn't all bad. And it was here where we got our first look at the beautiful Aqua interface that I think still looks gorgeous to this day. 
Now, if you know your history, you'll be aware that OS X was based on the technology that Apple purchased when they bought Steve Jobs' company, Next Computers. And it's actually a development of the Next OpenStep operating system. It isn't based on the OS 9 code at all. And in fact, classic Mac OS died with the burial of OS 9. And yet that actually happened. Now, one big change in OS X is the terminal. Previously, the Mac was one of the few systems that didn't actually have a command line interface. But here we are with a powerful terminal that gives you access to the soft Unix underbelly of OS X. And there are several applications that we still use today, like text edit, calculator, early versions of Apple Mail, and the menus and taskbar still look quite similar. And if the time in the top right of the screen wasn't enough, you can also run a dock-based clock as well. And speaking of the dock, this was the first time that we got to see Apple's new way of organizing and launching applications. And obviously, it stood the test of time. It is still the main way in macOS today. The system preferences look very similar to today, with the exception of this handy shortcut bar at the top for launching your most used control panels. I thought it was quite useful, actually. Now, at this early stage, there was a big lack of software for OS X. Safari was still a few years away. Instead, we got a preview of the OS X version of Internet Explorer as the main web browser, or there were some third-party ones, for example, OmniWeb. Sherlock was a carryover from OS 9, and it was the main search tool before the introduction of Spotlight. QuickTime Player is there as well. And despite that familiar looking logo that you see in my dock, there was no iTunes included or even made for OS X at this stage. So what exactly does that icon do? Well, to get around the lack of software for the new operating system, Apple actually included something that was a bit of a lifesaver for most users, the classic environment. Now this is a full OS 9 install that runs in a virtual machine on your OS X desktop, meaning that you can run your classic applications, as they were now termed, inside the new OS. And this actually works really well. Now, you do have a little bit of a delay in launching your first classic application of the day while the virtual machine loads up, but after that, they launch pretty much as quickly as they do in native OS 9. And they run in a kind of Unity mode, meaning they appear as programs running on your OS X desktop. And this does work well for the most part, despite the fact you obviously get a mismatch in the old and new user interface design. And sometimes the new OS X elements are not always aware of the older UI and sometimes get in the way. But it does mean you can run a lot of software on your OS X system. And it's quite cool that you can put the classic apps in your OS X dock. Now, despite the rocky start, OS X would turn out to be a great reliable operating system. And of course, it stood the test of time. It is still the operating system used on the Mac almost 20 years later. But why don't we go back a little bit further? This is Mac OS X Server 1.0, the very first product with OS X in the title that was released, and very different to what we've just seen. Now, while OS X Cheetah retains a lot of the stylings and things that we're familiar with today, the earlier OS X Server was released, but it wasn't intended for home users, hence the name Server. Released in 1999, this was the first time the public got to see a new Apple operating system based on the Next technology. And you can really see it here. The user interface is a real mixture of the Mac OS 8 Platinum theme and the Next Step UI. Most notably is the lack of Finder. Instead, it uses the Next Step Workspace Manager. And as you can see here from the About screen, it runs on the PostScript UI, not Quartz, like the later Mac OS X did. And again, we've got a lot of familiar looking applications here, as a lot of these were carried over to the Mac from Next Step and OpenStep. Now, OmniWeb, I believe, is the only browser that was released for this operating system. And some of the demos are quite interesting too. I do love the way that the folder has the Amiga Boing Ball icon on it. I thought that was a nice little touch. We've got the 3D GNU chess here. A few other small demos.
And this is really cool. It's called Boink Out. It's a breakout clone, which is a nice little nod to Apple's history, because you may know that Steve Jobs and Woz actually worked on Breakout at Atari before they started Apple in the late 70s. And again, you can run classic Mac applications via the Blue Box environment, which in this case boots into a full instance of Mac OS 8. And I do think it's really cool that you can switch back and forth between OS 10 server and Mac OS 8. To be honest, there's not really a lot that you can do in OS 10 Server 1.0 today, but it is a very interesting look at that bridge between Mac and Next Technology. So there you go, the Pimac G4. In my opinion, a fun and cheap system to explore and have fun with today, considering, as I said at the start of the video, you can pick these up for almost free, and they give you a really good way to check out a lot of the classic Mac software, not only from the PowerPC era, but also 68K as well. And a lot of these older tools, versions of Office, Photoshop, for example, are still usable for a lot of tasks today. And if you've enjoyed this video, be sure to check out my weekly retro gaming podcast. New episodes released every Friday. You can get it from wherever you normally get podcasts from, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or our website, theretrohour.com. And while you're here on YouTube, why not check out a few more of my videos? And I'll see you in the next one.